Let me introduce the first speaker today, and the speaker is Brandon Rhodes, who will be talking about the history of a science hidden in astronomy code. Now, following last year's success, Brandon Rhodes is backed by popular demand. He is best known as a popular uh, speaker at Python conferences, but he doesn't shy away from C, C++, and even bits of JavaScript. Brandon is excited to be back for his fourth code dive, and we are definitely thrilled to welcome him once again. So let's have a big hand for Brandon Rhodes and his presentation this year, the keynote, the history of a science hidden in astronomy code. to be back at another Code Dive. Uh, given the space theme of this year's conference, I decided that my topic would be the history of a science hidden in astronomy code. I'm going to weave back and forth then between three different topics. I'll be talking a little bit about my own Skyfield library, but I'm really going to use that as an excuse to talk some about the history of astronomy and also, since it is a software conference, to talk a bit about software design and some of the habits that I've picked up over the years. Skyfield uh, is an open source astronomy library written in Python, but using the famous scientific NumPy vector library in order to excel, uh, accelerate some of its computations. I should specify, lest anyone get confused, that I am only an amateur astronomer, and it is merely a positional astronomy library. What does that mean? Positional astronomy is the art of generating coordinates for stars and planets. Now, I should clarify, positional astronomy is not what most astronomers do, just like most programmers don't write compilers. Normal astronomers, one, get funding, two, sign up for observatory time, and then three, usually it's the observatory personnel, who might themselves be astronomers, who use positional astronomy to compute angles and point their instrument at the target. So, astronomy libraries for actual astronomers are mostly what you might call science Photoshop for the data they get back image processing, spectral analysis, radio signal processing. If you've ever seen a police show and they're looking at a blurry image and they say, zoom in, zoom in, now enhance. That's what normal astronomers are doing with the data that they get back. But Skyfield's job is positional astronomy itself. Give it a time and it will tell you the position of a star a planet, or a satellite. A single position is enough to aim a telescope, while a script that examines a whole series of positions can answer, what time does the sun set this evening? When is the next new moon? What month will Jupiter be brightest? When will the space station pass overhead? All of which can help in planning observations. And, of course, you can also use coordinates to draw pretty pictures. Here, drawn with Skyfield, is um, a star chart showing a recent comet from a few years ago and where you could find it among the stars. You can draw diagrams of the evening sky showing the months over which Venus will be visible and where along the horizon it will appear. Finally, um, you, this is a diagram of where the inner planets are right now, at the time of this talk, with some of the asteroids and with Jupiter in the next orbit out. The current theory is that the perturbation of Jupiter's gravity is what prevented a fifth rocky planet from ever forming, in addition to the four inner ones, and instead kept a field of asteroids floating in space between them. So, Skyfield, J 
generates coordinates is useful for anyone who wants to use Python to plan their own observations. But how does Skyfield work? Well, it reads NASA tables of XYZ planet positions, then turns those vectors into angles in the sky. Well, can you just subtract vectors? Can I get the XYZ position in the solar system of Jupiter, the XYZ position of the Earth, and subtract the two vectors to learn its relative position and look in that direction? It turns out, and this is much of the history of astronomy, no. It turns out that it takes more work. If we wrapped it up in a function, here's how we would generate a position. Yes, we start with the XYZ coordinates in the solar system of the Earth. But then we need to account for three different effects. Something called the light time correction, something called deflection, and then something called aberration, which depends on the Earth's velocity. Because it goes through those three steps, this code winds up including inside of itself a short history of astronomy. The light time correction, for example, discovered by Ole Romer in Denmark, he was observing Jupiter and its newly discovered moons, which had first been sighted just earlier that century. How does Jupiter move? Every 13 months or so, it emerges from behind the sun up into the morning sky. At first dim, it gets brighter and brighter over the months as it climbs away from the sun until finally it is high and bright in the midnight sky. Then, through another six months, it slowly every night appears lower and lower toward the sunset until it disappears again into the glare of the sun. Ole Romer watched this and watched Jupiter's moons. His observation was that Jupiter's fastest little moon, Io, revolves slightly faster in the morning sky than it does in the evening sky. Why would it change speed depending on where it was in the sky? He came up with a hypothesis that Copernicus, sorry, uh, Mikoai Copernic, and <laughs> Galileo were right, and that the Earth moves, that the Earth moves towards the morning sky and away from the evening sky. That's why the fans of meteor showers always tell you to get up at 1 or 2 a.m. They're not just trying to ruin your night of sleep. If you want to see things hitting the windshield, you look out the front window, not the back. Meteor showers are best viewed in the morning. The Earth moves towards the morning sky, and finally, Romer thought that maybe light takes time to travel. The consequence would be that the light time delay between us and Jupiter would get shorter when Jupiter is up in the morning sky and we're catching up to it, so Io would look faster and events would come quicker. The light time delay would then get longer again once we've passed Jupiter and left it behind and it's fading into the evening sky, and as the light time delay to Jupiter stretches out, Io would look slower he wound up being perfectly correct, and all astronomy li uh, uh, libraries and computations today need to perform a light time correction. I asked Skyfield, and as of the moment of this talk right now, Jupiter is 33.4 light minutes away, so Skyfield needs to use Jupiter's position from a half hour ago to generate coordinates, because we don't see, we cannot see, Jupiter right now, we only see the light that left it 33.4 minutes ago. So, how big a difference does this make? Well, for the fastest planet, little Mercury, in the fastest orbit, smallest orbit around the Sun, it can make a difference of up to 40 arc seconds in where you point an Earth-based instrument. I know what you're thinking, some of you. What is an arc second? 
let us have a brief discursus on units of measure. If you were going to design a unit of measure, how many units would you choose to make a whole? Well, our ancestors loved numbers that have lots of divisors. You might have played with this pattern in grade school, that four is the first number with another divisor between it, uh, besides itself and one, the number two. It only holds on to the title of having the most divisors until you get to six, which has two of them. Six then holds on to the title until you get to 12, which has four divisors besides itself and one. These winning numbers that have more divisors than any previous number are techni technically known as highly composite numbers. But some few of them are especially important because we noticed that six hangs on to, to, uh, to its title of having the most divisors as long as it possibly can until twice six, at which point you've multiplied by two, so you're obviously going to have more divisors. And though you cannot see it in this diagram, because I didn't go all the way to 24, 12 is similar. It hangs on to the title with four divisors all the way to the number 24. Six and 12, therefore, are parts of a very special series, which you can find online in the catalog of integer series, the highly composite numbers that are half of the next highly composite number, it's a very exclusive club. I'm told that mathematicians have proven that these are the only seven members of that exclusive club. One, two, six, 12, 60, 360, 25, 20. Those are the only ones. I had never heard of 25, 20 until I was actually preparing for this talk. It is, it turns out, famous as being the smallest number divisible by every number from 1 to 10. Thus, as you might predict, predict it's 360 times 7, which is why it looks so odd. We have proven that these are the only highly divisible numbers that have this special property. And thus, in the ancient world, these were favorite numbers for units of measure. For example, we were free to choose any number of hours in a day, Looking at nature, there's not 12 things that happen evenly spaced through the day. But we loved using that highly divisible number 12 on a sundial to divide the hours of daylight. Cultures might have had different ways of dividing the night, but very quickly everyone agreed that it was beautiful to measure the day with 12 hours. We were not left free by nature to choose the number of months a year because it was originally the number of moons per year. And there are about 12 new moons and full moons every year. Not exactly, so they fall on different dates every year. But even when we got tired of the shifting dates and switched to artificial months that we made up, we still kept that beautiful number 12 that the course of the moon had given us. So we used 12, but in this case, because of nature. We think the story might have been similar with a number of degrees in a circle, because 360 degrees in a circle is very close to the size of the step that the sun makes across the sky every day. The sun actually takes 365 steps around the course of the sky every year, moving across the background of the stars. And I guess we could have had a unit system where there were 365 and a quarter degrees in a circle. But 365 and a quarter was so close to this gorgeous number, 360, that we couldn't resist. And it's thought that that is what influenced our choice of degrees in a circle. Uh, it's very interesting that the two kind of fundamental divisions of the year, how many moons are there during a year, how many rotations of the Earth are there during a year, are both within a percent or two of one of these very, very, very few special highly composite numbers. Uh, it's, it's quite a nice coincidence for, for our species to, have got, species to have gotten to enjoy. A question then arose. An hour is a pretty long time, a degree of sky is pretty big. How should we divide them when we need smaller pieces, more precision? 
Well, the ancients apparently thought that inventing a whole unit of measure and getting only 12 pieces was not enough additional precision to be worth working on. And dividing something into 360 pieces is going to be very small marks on your ruler. So they decided to go for 60. They defined a 60th of something as a pars minuta. A small part of something was a 60th of it, so now they could divide an hour into pieces. They then pretty quickly learned that even a minute is a pretty long period of time, in the sense that you might want to divide it smaller. Well, they decided to divide by 60 again. They now had a first little part, pars minuta prima, and a second 60th, a second little part, pars minuta secunda, a second order 60th, if you want to think of it that way. And that is why they are called, in English, the minute and the second. If you ever wondered, well, why is it called a second? What was the first one? The minute is the first 60th, and it's called the second because it's the second 60th. We got tired of speaking Latin. We used these divisions as kind of the ancient world's universal decimal point. It was how we divided hours into smaller pieces, and also the degrees of uh, a geometer's triangle or an astronomer's sky into smaller pieces. That created some possible ambiguity, since I don't know if you know any astronomers, but they have a habit of sometimes using a time and an angle in the same sentence. So, astronomers started to, a century or two ago, they, they try to sometimes use arc in front of the pieces of a degree to try to remove that ambiguity, so they might state this measure as 12 degrees, 34 arc minutes, 56 arc seconds. Though, if they're in a hurry, you might hear your astronomer friend just say 34 minutes, 56 seconds, and hope that the context makes it clear that it's fractions of a degree. To give you now some physical sense, the width of the moon or sun is about half a degree wide. If you've seen the full moon, that's about half a degree. The naked eye resolution of a someone with very sharp vision looking at the stars, looking at a little star cluster, maybe the Pleiades, can only get down to one or two arc minutes. T typically, even the best viewers cannot see a detail that is only an arc minute. That's just under what is perceptible. 10 by 50 binoculars, though, can get you down to 10 arc seconds, fractions of an arc minute. And finally, if you get down to a telescope that can show you one or two arc seconds of detail, then you won't be able to go farther because of the blurring that the atmosphere produces, unless you go to a high mountain, go to space, or invent adaptive optics, all of which we've now done. Radio telescopes can go much farther because they're not worried about atmospheric blur. Did I just mention binoculars? In case the space topic of this uh, code dive makes any of you interested, let me say a few quick notes about binoculars. A good pair of 10 by 50 binoculars will show you Jupiter's moons, star clusters, craters on the moon, and some of the brighter galaxies. In binoculars, images are right side up, whereas a telescope, because of its mirrors, often makes you move it one way to make the image move another. Binoculars let you use both eyes. Uh, you have a large image correction. Uh, mechanism in your brain, which builds a more perfect image out of, uh, you know, edits all the floaties out by comparing the two eyes. Whereas with a telescope, it can take years to become an expert in seeing details with just one eye. They're portable, easy to grab, you don't need to set them up on a tripod. And while 569 Zwadi will not get you a very good telescope, it will probably be made of plastic and disappoint you, a friend, or a child who's interested in astronomy. That same amount will get you a very nice pair of Nikon, Aculon, 10 by 50 binoculars, which will be top of the line. People always associate astronomy with telescopes, but very often binoculars will get you more of the sky more quickly. But if you, a friend, a child, are interested in astronomy, it might be even better to start with a book explaining what you might be able to see. It will have a whole chapter on the difference between binoculars and a telescope. Having given you that practical advice, in case any of this makes you interested in the sky, 
we will end the aside on measurements and go back to our chart. You now understand, when I put the number 40 arc seconds here, you now know that that means a bit beyond what we can discern visually, because that's uh, what two-thirds of an arc uh, minute, but well within the range of telescopes, which is why it was um, discovered several centuries ago. All right, so light time correction is a first adjustment we need to make. What is aberration? That was discovered by an astronomer, James Bradley, as he more and more precisely was uh, learning the positions of stars. He noticed something odd. A star was slightly out of position. And then it went back. And then the next star he measured was out of position. And when, then it went back. And he noticed that all the stars in the sky were going every year out of position and back, out of position and back, out of position and back. What was going on? If you've ever driven when it's snowing, you'll note that it looks like the snow is coming at you, even though it's really the velocity of you and the car. Bradley realized that in the same way, the Earth's motion around the sun makes it look like photons of light are aiming slightly more from a forward direction than they really are. Thus, the Earth's motion forward makes everything out to the side appear to be a little further ahead of us than it really is. And as the, Earth, uh, as the Earth's velocity vector spins the whole way around during a year, the stars go forward and back and forward and back. That is called aberration, and it is really that that convinced the scientific community that the Earth was moving. Galileo, all of these others, they, they were an exotic hypothesis, but it was the discovery and the confirmation that all the stars are moving every year a little bit that convinced scientists, you know, I think it's us, not them. We must be moving. The effect is about 20 arc seconds. Uh, again, not something you would see with your eyes. Its discovery awaited the telescope. Finally, with deflection, we got out ahead of this whole thing. Do you notice how much of the history of science so far is our instruments getting better and we see something we never guessed? And then we have to come up with some explanation? Finally, with deflection, we predicted something before it happened. Einstein, 1915, the idea that light passing something massive in the solar system, like the sun or like Jupiter, would bend as it went past its mass. I know what you're going to say. Brandon, didn't Newton suggest that light might be made of particles, of corpuscles, as I think he called them? Yes. Didn't Newton say that if light was made of particles, it would bend as it passed a massive object? Yes. Didn't he compute the angle? Yes. Didn't Einstein, in his special theory of rel relativity, show that it also predicted the same effect at the same size? Yes. So why am I listing Einstein here? Because that was young Einstein. This is 1915. This is grown-up Einstein, general relativity. Once he had his full theory and its very complicated math assembled, he did the calculation again, and the possible deflection is twice what classical mechanics or special relativity had predicted. So he gets the credit for predicting before it had ever been observed how big the amount of deflection would be. In this case, the maximum we can get in our solar system is if the light of a star is going right past the sun, it can be at 1.7 arc seconds. Not something that is easy to observe from the ground or even a high altitude telescope, uh, and something that only got widespread confirmation once we had radio telescopes that needed to worry about effects this small. But finally, finally we got out in front of this science thing and started making predictions. It was a great day. So, our get position function that we looked at a few minutes ago is in one sense a fun short history of astronomy, light time correction, deflection, aberration, all the things our species had to learn about light in order to plan accurate observations. But as code, it's pretty terrible. And this is a software conference. Let's talk a bit about that. Why is it terrible? Because it traps us in what I will call a parameter 
treadmill. Let us say that we get hit by one of the worst things to hit code, a user. Someone trying to use, which remember is probably you two months later, trying to use code that you've written. And let's say the user has a question. How do I ask this wonderful new routine for astrometric coordinates, which are coordinates that, uh, so you can look them up on a star chart, they uh, ignore temporary adjustments like aberration and deflection. Well, if we look at our routine, there isn't any way to skip aberration and deflection. It happens automatically as part of calling get position. How can we let the user skip aberration deflection without breaking existing calls? Because everyone's used to calling this with just two arguments. There are different approaches in different languages. Python allows optional arguments. Uh, if you give an argument a default, it doesn't have to be provided, so all existing calls keep working. You always should choose a default that keeps the original behavior, or you break all existing code. By adding the optional argument, we now can let the caller skip deflection and aberration. We now have a routine that can produce two kinds of coordinates. Well, we might be happy, but then we might get hit by another user. But I need XYZ coordinates. XYZ coordinates? Oh, well, look at that. We are always, we are computing the XYZ, the vector, every time, but we don't return it. We throw it out. We just co convert it to a pair of angles and return those. Well, all right, time to add another optional argument. We give users a way to ask for angles instead. Uh, or to turn off angles and get back the raw vector if that's what they need. Mission accomplished. Then yet another user might show up. I need to adjust the list of deflectors. Full disclosure, I've just been asked for, actually a couple of months ago I was asked for this in the, my astronomy library and I need to go do it. Uh, the issue here is that this code has just chosen the three most massive things beside, you know, uh, in our solar system, Sun, Jupiter, and Saturn, as the uh, objects to account for. And if the caller needs to adjust that, here they have no way of doing so. It's hard-coded. So, of course, we need to add another optional parameter, pulling that list out where users can provide their own version of the list if they need to. This is what I call the parameter treadmill, where you're forever adding more flags and settings because it turns out that things that you hard-coded need to be adjusted for different users. So eventually, you're just going to get a whole stack of parameters. As more and more special ca uh, cases are discovered, code then becomes littered with if statements having to check all of the flags, and it becomes hard to test all possible code paths through a function. The Python standard library itself has functions like this, so it's, it's perfectly survivable. There is a json.dump to string function that, if you go look in the docs, has clearly been on the parameter treadmill for quite some time. It's survivable, it can work, but it's non-optimal. So, if it's non-optimal, what's the alternative to the parameter treadmill? Well, the complete opposite approach is what I like calling Lego bricks. Lego bricks, small interchangeable routines which the caller assembles into a solution. In this case, our hypothetical astro library might just provide the raw correction routines and we might give the user an example to cut and paste into their code that leaves them in charge of running and maintaining these four lines of code that call the corrections in the correct order. The benefit is the user now has full control, but I need astrometric coordinates. Great, comment out deflection and aberration, but I need XYZ coordinates. All right, skip the final conversion. I need to adjust the list of deflectors. It's right there. Just edit it. It's suddenly, uh, suddenly the user is now self-serve. They can go make changes themselves without asking you, opening an issue, and making you come out with a new version of your library. But there are some problems. 
the user now has to maintain correctness. I don't know if you've ever spent an hour staring at your code, staring at the example, and trying to figure out what you changed that evidently has broken the code that you cut and pasted, but it can be a long search. The library can no longer make improvements because this now lives inside of the code of every user of the library, and in one sense, it's the wrong level of abstraction. The word apparent doesn't appear here because this library has kind of abdicated responsibility for higher level concepts like that. So is there a medium between the uh, parameter treadmill of having a single routine and the uh, primitiveness of Lego bricks? For Skyfield, I got a lot of traction out of method changing. Maybe I'd been using J, uh, jQuery that month or something. What I decided to do was set up the computation as a series of method calls. Earth.att returns an object that holds the Earth's XYZ vector. Dot observe Mars calls the Mars object to ask where it is, subtracts the light travel time, and asks again to find out where Mars was when light left it. Returns a new object that's an XYZ. A relative XYZ vector. Dot apparent adjusts that by uh, uh, aberration and deflection and returns another object holding the XYZ vector. And finally, its dot coordinates method lets you turn that into angles in the sky so you can aim. The method chain means that when a user says, I need astrometric coordinates, we say, great, skip the dot apparent call. But I need XYZ coordinates. Well, all right, don't call dot coordinates, just ask the object for the raw vector. All of a sudden, a lot of user use cases could now be satisfied by slight adjustments to the method chain. Now, the method chain doesn't solve everything. As I said, someone has opened an issue where they need to adjust the list of deflectors, and you know that is currently hard-coded in the apparent method, so you still get hit by needing to support customization in some cases, but that's the only one that's hit me so far. Otherwise, it's all been possible to answer user questions by adjusting the methods that are called. The method chain operates at a high level of abstraction. Notice the word apparent has come back to our code. It makes sure methods are called in the right order. I don't let you call dot apparent. I don't give you an object with dot apparent until you've called a dot observe, so I can enforce the order things happen in and make sure it's correct. It exposes intermediate results. The user can stop and examine the raw vector at any point they want, and it lets the user stop early if they don't need the whole computation carried out without my needing to add an if statement. So that was habit number one that I learned while maintaining uh, Skyfield, the method chain as a possible alternative to the parameter treadmill or to Lego bricks. I'll go through two more habits that I learned that might be generally applicable when you're writing software. Habit number two is what I called configuration objects. It happened like this. The Earth that you're st sitting on, I almost said standing, but I'm the one standing, the Earth is an oblate spheroid. The centrifugal force of our rotation makes the Earth's equator bulge larger than the Earth's radius at the poles. So an XYZ vector from Earth's center to a city or observatory will have a different radius depending on latitude. Skyfield at first hard-coded the standard WGS84 geoid parameters for turning latitude and longitude into an XYZ vector, a radius and flattening that are agreed upon as a standard and are used in GPS. So these are the ones everybody uses. It worked. But WGS84's role was invisible. You just give a latitude longitude, and you get back a place that has an X, Y, and a Z. Along came a user and said something like, but my data set is older and uses WGS72. What do I do? And I looked at the code and I said, drat, WGS84 and its parameters are currently hard-coded. There's no way to specify WGS72. A number of options were open to me. 
The worst idea, of course, would have been global configuration. Ah, Skyfield can have a set geoid shape that globally changes the radius and flattening that's then used when you later call place. The problems with this are very well known. It is invisible action at a distance, unless you know the rule. You're not going to remember later, possibly, that the set geoid shape call at the top of your program affects place calls that might happen hundreds of lines later. It ruins thread safety, because if one thread calls set geoid shape, it's now changed latitudes and longitudes for all other threads, and for exactly the same reason, you've now tightly coupled your tests. Slightly better, I realized, would be to get on the old parameter treadmill and give place a geoid parameter that named, that overrode the choice of geoid. Um, Skyfield's not going to know what WGS72 is, so I'll have to have a global registry of geoids, and the user will have to tell me what those parameters are. But at least um, that global state, even if it exists, it's not automatically changing what place does when you call it. Even better, I realized, instead of accepting a name, WGS72, let's just accept a geoid object itself. Why use a name to go look up a struct when I can just tell the user, hey, have the caller simply build and pass in their own geoid struct, and we won't even need a global registry. They are free to allocate a new little geoid struct with its parameters and pass it in if they want it used instead. I was getting pretty happy. But then I imagined, and in fact, I was the user in this case, a user saying, well, what if I already have the XYZ for a place? Oh, well, then we're in trouble. The constructor for place doesn't accept an X, Y, or Z. It insists on computing them from a latitude and longitude. So to build one of these objects with a hand chosen X, Y, and Z, you'd have to generate a latitude and longitude for that X, Y, Z, and then pass them back in so that X, Y, and Z could be recomputed. I had made an error. I had made a smart constructor where I should always remember to just have dumb constructors that copy data in. So the best solution wound up being this. Abandon the idea that the place constructor does special extra work for you to be convenient. Place should just take an X, Y, Z. Then I can give the geoid class a method that builds a place from a latitude longitude. You know, I should have known something was going wrong when the place constructor was pulling all these radius and flattening attributes off of another object to know how to do its job. The logic that uses a flattening and a radius clearly belongs on that object itself. So I rearranged so that users would always call a geoid dot latlon in order to build a location on the Earth's surface. The geoid parameter disappears, we've escaped the parameter treadmill, and the choice of geoid is now always explicit. The fact that my library uses WGS84 isn't a hidden assumption anymore. You have to find in the documentation every user's code, whether they know what this is or not, maybe they're just following the example, imports WGS84 and calls .latlon with the location they're observing from. It's now visible in everyone's code, rather than it being exceptional to know which geoid you're using. The configuration object approach also worked for earth, earth orientation, which is a topic uh, all of its own. It was discovered uh, probably by the ancient Babylonians. It was certainly known by the ancient Greeks that the Earth's axis precesses. It goes over 26,000 years in a huge circle, visiting a series of different pole stars and the space in between them. Polaris is, is an unusually good pole star. Usually, they're not this close. Um, and that makes an enormous difference, but very slowly. Over a long period of time, coordinates change by 46 degrees as our axis makes a full circle, 26,000 years of the sky. Nutation. Bradley, remember him? He also, later in his career, discovered that the masses in the solar system, the moon, the sun, Jupiter, as they tug on us, that causes a smaller wobble, about 18 arc seconds big, in our axis, called nutation, which, of course, adjusts your telescope coordinates accordingly. 
Then it was in the 1800s that we discovered polar motion, that once you've done all the calculations for precession and nutation, everything that gravity could explain, we're just on a crazy planet. As glaciers are melting and continents are rebounding, and apparently they've recently said uh, NASA thinks that a lot of this is driven by ocean currents in the Pacific, the jiggling mass of continents and water that you're sitting on right now jiggles day to day at the 0.4 arc second level and really messes with the radio telescope people. Precession and nutation Skyfield can support with a long-term formula, but polar motion's like the weather. It's like this little adjustment that just changes day to day and you have to go look it up. There's an international Earth rotation service which has a data file you can download each day, you know, to find out where your planet's pointing. They have nice charts of how this extra little adjustment, this chart is about half an arc second tall, of how it has wobbled and moved over the couple of decades that they've been doing high precision measurements of our planet's motion. A terrible idea would, of course, have been to make polar motion global and had Skyfield have a call where you load up the polar motion and it changes all of Skyfield's calculations invisibly. Or I could have gotten on the parameter treadmill, and when you build a time, I could have had you pass Earth orientation in. Instead, Skyfield code uses a configuration object. Again, in this case, I call it a time scale that loads the IERS data and serves as a factory for time objects. I use this pattern again and once again. No global settings, no invisible action at a distance, no parameter treadmill that I need to get on and ride, and multiple time scale objects can coexist if you want to load up two Earth orientation files and compare results. If you have different threads or different tests that want to use different files, it's fine because they're all creating their own time scale object, which each have their own data loaded in order to build times. So that was the second habit I learned. Configuration objects, putting configuration in an actual object that the user builds and uses rather than hiding it away in global state. All right, a third quick one. I had to learn healthy boundaries. An example, a star chart I realized years ago, maybe more people will use my astronomy library if I show pretty pictures, if you can do star charts like the one that I showed earlier, where they can maybe get an object and its coordinates and plot it in front of the beautiful stars and constellations. So the temptation then, oh, I should give users a star chart function that makes it look so easy, so few lines of code, and draws it for them. And then I looked at this diagram and thought, is a user going to be happy with all of my choices of font and color and size? Or is it likely that if I publish this function, I am going to be hit by the user, saying, how do I change the scale, the colors, the font size, how many stars are shown, the date format, the marker color, anything you can imagine. This is graphic design, right? Everyone thinks, th everyone wants to do their own graphic design. Everyone wants to choose their own font on the web. The, um, all of these things, people are going to want to customize. And where am I going to wind up? I'm going to wind up on a never-ending parameter treadmill, having to issue a new version of my astronomy library and close yet another issue every time somebody finds anything they need to adjust. So, as a solution, in this case, I went full Lego because this isn't about the relationship between different parts of my library where I might want more control and might want more coupling, like the method chain. This is about the foreign affairs with another library, the popular but exceptionally complicated Matplotlib library for plotting pictures. So instead, Skyfield's docs provide a full working example of how to A, ask Skyfield for some coordinates, and then B, go plot the star chart yourself. Uh, it's a big several page example. I tried to, you know, to get them started. I tried to, to, to show them everything I could, how to do fonts, how to do lines, how to do stars. 
but the magic of example code that you haven't written up as a function is that the user can cut and paste the example into their own project, and then they can change anything they want without having to ask me, without me getting another issue on GitHub and having to release a new version. So whenever possible, avoid getting in the way of a conversation between the user's code and another complicated library. Don't become a go-between for something complicated. This actually even can help you in simple cases. The philosophy of getting out of the way even works for simple things like I.O. It's tempting to do the user a favor by creating an output file for them. Call my compute data function, just give me the file name. I'll go create the file. Someone will then come along and say, oh, but I need to save it to a database, not a file. Oh, but I need to send it over a socket. The user can't skip the step of saving to a file if we hard-coded that inside the function. Instead, leave I.O. to the user. Let the user go open the file. Yes, your example will have one more line of code, but if they pass the open file to you, then you haven't made that crucial decision and maybe overrode what they really need. A file object argument always leaves the user free to swap in another object that writes to a database or a socket or whatever. They get full control, and you escape the parameter treadmill. Habit three that I learned was healthy boundaries. To return control as soon as possible and let the caller decide what happens next. So, I hope you found the details about astronomy uh, interesting, but I expect your immediate takeaways are going to be these three habits that I learned while maintaining a library. Get off the parameter treadmill when you have the chance. Store configuration in objects. Don't think it always has to be stored and hidden globally. Set healthy boundaries and get out of the way as soon as you can. And then finally, if you're ever maybe outside the city and it's dark and there aren't clouds and you look up, I don't know, maybe grab a telescope or a pair of binoculars and on a dark night, try looking at the sky. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your inspiring talk, Brandon. Uh, we've got time just for maybe one quick question or two. Anyone? Yeah, that's one over there, please. Just a quick question. Really quick one. Uh, so uh, you return X, Y, Z coordinates of objects on the night sky. Could you tell us what is the origin of this Cartesian system and uh, why this decision was made. Is the sun the center of gravity of the solar system or the earth? Like, do you honor Copernicus or someone else? Uh, so the question is, what is the origin of the Cartesian system for the XYZ coordinates that Skyfield uses? Uh, when you establish the position of your observatory, that needs to be based on the solar system barycenter because the uh, com computation of light deflection depends on your observatory's philosophy relative to the uh, center of mass of the solar system. So you add together the vector of the sun to the, uh, the sorry the solar system barycenter to the Earth to the center of the Earth to your observatory, and the sum of those two vectors gives you your origin. Once you then do the light time correction, though, and are, well, where is Mars relative, relative to me? You are then, for the rest of the calculation, working with an XYZ vector based at your observatory telescope city. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Brandon, just before we go, one quick thing. So you mentioned Einstein and his relativity. So my understanding is that he proved that time is not a fixed concept. And the faster you move, the slower your clock ticks. Is that correct? 
Especially at conferences, yes. Exactly. Thank you so much. So what we are now going to prove is the Einstein's relativity. So we are going to take a 15-minute break, which is going to last only three minutes because we are going to move very, very fast. Brandon Rose, everyone. Thank you.